Hello, I'm the Reverend Sarah Face Marlam, pastor of Sand Hill United Methodist Church in Boaz, West Virginia, and pastor of Wayside United Methodist Church in Vienna, West Virginia. Our gospel lesson is from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His father said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I ran into Piggly Wiggly last week to, to grab a couple of things for dinner. And the cashier, uh, as the cashier was totaling my purchase, I noticed that he deducted 5% from the price. He gave me the senior citizen's discount. And I'm not a senior citizen. My college-age daughter was waiting for me in the car that day, and she laughed when I told her I got the discount. My girls laugh whenever people give me senior discounts or when they refer to me as their grandma. I laugh too. It's been happening since I was a, a teenager. That's when I got my first senior citizen's discount. I know it's the hair, and it really doesn't bother me. People see white hair, and they think older, mature, senior citizen. I've been going gray since I've had hair. So I've never equated it with advanced age. I inherited my prematurely gray hair from my grandmother Branham. And for me, it's a connection to her and a visual reminder of her. I hope I inherited a lot more from her, like her joy for life, her generosity, her nurturing spirit. Grandmother was an amazing cook, and boy, did she ever love to cook. Her cooking was an expression of her joy for life and her generosity and her nurturing spirit. She cooked for everyone, family, friends neighbors. She would even bake cakes and make casseroles for neighbors to take to, to their churches for their covered dish dinners. She would take the bag boys at, at the grocery store. She would take them cookies and homemade Chex Mix. 
Whenever grandmother had people in for a meal, she would make everyone's favorite dish. She would make Logan's favorite dip and Diana's favorite dessert and someone else's favorite salad. One time I took a friend with me to grandmother's for my birthday meal. She made homemade lasagna. And grandmother had never met my friend before. She didn't know what any of her favorites were. So she made her Toll House bars. My friend loved them, and she still talks about them and about my grandmother. There was always plenty of food at grandmother's when she was hosting a meal. There were always lots of leftovers, too. And she'd send those home with guests. Nothing ever went to waste. But even so, after every meal, we would tell her, next time maybe we don't need so much food. Maybe you said that in your family too. Maybe next time we don't need so much food. But next time there would be just as much, sometimes even more, if she found a new recipe that she really wanted to try. When I think of meals at grandmother's, I think of abundance. There was always enough for everyone. There was more than enough. If she had been in charge of ordering the wine for the wedding at Cana, there would have been enough. There would have been more than enough for the wedding festivities. Weddings in first century Palestine were no small affair. Everyone in the village and everyone who knew the couple and their families, they were invited. The feasting and the celebration, it would have lasted for days, maybe a week even or more. When the food and wine ran out. That was the signal that the wedding party was over. Jesus, his mother, and his disciples, they were at a wedding in Cana. And we're told on the thir third day there was a wedding. It isn't clear if it's the third day of the wedding or if John is calling our attention to the fact that something really important is about to happen. On the third day, it calls up memories of that other third day when just at daybreak, deep grief turned into rejoicing. Jesus' mother found him at the wedding and she told him, they ran out of wine. This was a really big deal. It meant that the fat festivities would have been cut short, cut prematurely short. And it would have been extremely embarrassing to the hosts. Shameful. We don't know why the wine ran out. Was it poor planning? Were the hosts poor and they couldn't afford to buy what they needed? Were neighbors and extended family supposed to bring food and drink and didn't, showing a lack of community support? What we do know is that theirs was a culture of honor and shame. And the hosts' reputation would have been damaged. They would have felt great shame at running out of wine and not providing the expected hospitality for their guests. They ran out of wine. Jesus' mother seemed concerned. Why did she share her concern with Jesus? What 
did she know about him and his ability to do something about the problem? Jesus told him, it's none of our business and it's not the right time. But Mary didn't say anything to him in reply. Instead, she told the servants, do whatever he tells you. There were six large stone jars standing nearby, and Jesus told the servants to fill them with water. And the jars were filled to the brim. Jesus told them to draw some of the liquid out and to take it to the chief steward, which they did. The steward was puzzled, and when he spoke to the bridegroom, he said, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now? Jesus turned between 120 to 180 gallons of water into 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Not cheap wine or so so wine, but good wine. What an abundantly extravagant miracle. When we think of Jesus and miracles, we usually think of him helping those who are in desperate need, like those who need healing. He healed those who were blind, deaf, lame, had leprosy, or had uncontrolled bleeding, he cast out demons. We think of him calming storms and raging seas. We think of him preserving life, improving the quality of life, even restoring the lives of those who died. This is a very different kind of miracle. It almost seems frivolous given the world that we live in and the troubles of our world then and now. John doesn't call Jesus turning water into wine a miracle, though. He calls it a sign. There are seven signs in John's Gospel. And they all tell us something about the character and the nature of Jesus. They witness to who Jesus is. Everyone at the wedding at Cana of Galilee benefited from Jesus' miraculous activity. The bridegroom and his family, the steward, they were all spared from embarrassment. The guests got to enjoy good wine. But not everyone at the wedding even realized what Jesus had done. Not everyone witnessed this sign. This first sign was revealed to a small group of people. Jesus' mother, some servants, and his disciples. John tells us that because of this sign, his disciples believed in him. Perhaps the disciples, when they saw Jesus turn water into wine, perhaps they saw echoes of the words of the prophets coming to life. Isaiah wrote of the Messianic age to come, In chapter 25, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain 
the shroud that is cast over all people, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. The hope of God's people, Israel, the hope that God's people, Israel, had held onto for centuries was that the Messiah was on the way. God would restore them and their land and their fortunes. When the Messiah's time did come, it would be with abundance. Amos had prophesied that the mountains would drip sweet wine and all the hills would flow with it. God's people would rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They would plant vineyards and enjoy the fruits of their labor, eating their fruit and drinking their wine. So this sign, his disciples saw this sign and believed in him. What does this sign say to us about the character and nature of Jesus? Well, how we view God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it matters. It affects how we relate to God and others and how we live in this world. If we view God as joyless, stingy, and vengeful, then we're likely to live in fear of judgment. We're likely to be judgmental of others and to be joyless and stingy ourselves. But if we view God as being joyful and generous, a God of abundance, then we will be joyful in our lives with God and with others. We will be generous in sharing our prayers and resources and service with God and neighbor. May our hearts, minds, and spirits be open to seeing and experiencing God's goodness and God's abundant generosity. May we look for and see signs of God's goodness in our lives and in our world. And may we take every opportunity to reflect God's goodness and generosity. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Remind us that you not only turn water into wine, but you turn shame and despair into rejoicing. You turn worry into wonder. As you are joyful, generous, and extend grace to us, help us to be joyful, dealing with ourselves and others with a spirit of generosity and grace. We pray that through our words and actions and lives, through our witness, you may be made known to a hurting, broken world. We pray in your precious holy name. Amen. And now hear these words of blessing from Philippians 4, 7. Go in peace. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.